Good evening, everyone. We're very pleased to welcome you all this evening to our 2020 information seminar. This is the third year that we are using a virtual format, and we're delighted to see that so many of you have joined us on what is also International Credit Union Day, the 74th anniversary, with the theme of Empower Your Financial Future with the Credit Union. I hope that you may have had some opportunity to acknowledge this at a local level. The role of credit union directors, board oversight committee members, volunteers, management and staff, together with credit union members, are important and differentiating features of credit unions. I note also that the annual CXI report results published earlier this week with credit unions topping the ranking again. One of the observations by the report's author was about credit unions not replacing people with digital, but using them in a different way to offer other products and services and to deal with member issues quickly and effectively, demonstrating understanding of the importance of balancing the digital experience with the human touch. Your experience and commitment in your roles is a vital component in ensuring that credit unions maintain and grow sustainable businesses to serve their members' needs and protect their savings. We acknowledge your continued work and cooperation with us here in the registry over the last year, recognising the continuing challenging times for all. We also recognise that this is a particularly busy time at your credit unions given the 30th of September financial year end. Our staff here in the registry are committed to working with you over the coming period in order to assure, ensure an efficient and professional process for the 2022 year end. Before I introduce the topics on the agenda for this evening, I want to say a few words on the central bank strategy for 2022 to 26, which includes four connected themes, safeguarding, future focused, transforming and open and engaged, aimed at ensuring that our direction and ambitions over the next five years are responsive and forward looking and link to the reference in legislation when the bank was being established in 1942, that the central bank's constant and predominant aim shall be the welfare of people as a whole. Briefly on the four themes, safeguarding includes effective regulation of financial services and markets while ensuring the best interests of consumers of financial services are protected. Future Focused recognises that the world we operate in is changing rapidly and we want to be ready to deliver through these changes. Transforming recognises the need to invest in new skills and capabilities and being agile to meet the challenges of an evolving financial system. And open and engaged includes being well connected with our stakeholders, explaining what we are doing and not doing, and listening so we can understand the issues and also help stakeholders understand the actions we are taking in response. An important step in strengthening engagement is on consumer related issues with the recent launch by the bank of a consumer protection discussion paper available on our website and open for feedback until March 2023. Its purpose is facilitation of two way discussion and engagement with a range of interested parties to enhance broader understanding of the role and work of the central bank in terms of consumer protection and to inform the planned review of the Consumer Protection Code. The Registry is committed to being open and engaged, and this annual information seminar is one part of our engagement and communication strategy. Other aspects of our engagement approach include our regular meetings with individual credit unions, representative bodies, Department of Finance, CUAC, and other key sector stakeholders as well as our regular publications, including the Financial Conditions of Credit Union Statistical Series, our Credit Union Newsletter, a second edition of 2022 due to issue very shortly, and our regular circulars, all of which are intended to support and inform you on a range of supervisory and policy areas. So turning now to the agenda for this evening, and a number of my colleagues in the registry will present 
some of whom you may know from previous years, they are on the brain, Mark Ward, John Marr, James McCauley and Nuala Lawless. The topics that will be covered are firstly year end 2022, secondly climate change, thirdly some policy snapshots including MPCAS and a lending overview, and fourthly the central bank portal and information update. The presentations will be followed by a Q&A session which will be facilitated by David Kilty and then Eamon Clark will wrap up the session. If you have any questions on any of the topics covered after this evening, please feel free to contact our office by email and we will respond to you. The full session, including the Q&A, will take about an hour and a quarter, so we will finish up by 6.30 p.m. We are recording the presentations and they will be available on our website in due course. Copies of the presentations will also be available on our website and a link will be provided to your credit union. So at this stage now, I'll hand over to Owen McGrain for the first of the presentations on 2022 year end. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, on the next slide, you will uh, see that uh, today I'm going to focus on uh, the year end, the contents of our year end circular issued to all credit unions last month, which you should all have seen by now. I'd like to touch on the economic environment and the outlook that we are currently facing, the various impairment reviews required before drafting your financial statements, pension schemes, ORCU's expectations in relation to distributions and prudent reserve management, systems and control and cybersecurity, accrued interest, and then the submission of the draft financial statements themselves. The economic environment and outlook. Unfortunately, the economic environment for credit unions remains challenging and the outlook uncertain. Following a rapid economic recovery from the pandemic downturn, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led to lower global, global growth expectations and intensified inflationary pressures. The Ukraine conflict has also further exacerbated the supply side challenges evident in the global economy. These were already arising as a result of the pandemic recovery. High energy prices are the most obvious example of the challenges that have come to fore in 2022. While the Irish economy is still forecast to grow, higher and mostly externally driven inflation will weigh down on households and businesses in the short term. This is projected to reduce disposable income for households, slow the growth rate of consumer spending and increase the medium term uncertainty. Last year, the concerns with regard to the economic outlook were firmly pandemic related and thankfully many of those concerns have diminished. Unfortunately, those concerns have now been replaced by lower global growth expectations, significant price pressures, and tightened financial conditions. Welcome to Welcome. If you just could you ensure that you're just on mute, please. Last, uh, while the removal of the pandemic supports were expected to see an increase in the unemployment rate, this has not been as significant as, ex as expected. In contrast, measures of labour market tightness continue to be high with staff shortages evident in many sectors. This, coupled with price pressures, point to emerging cyclical pressures in certain sectors, including the housing market. While some of these risks may indirectly impact on the credit union sector, they all exacerbate the risks and challenges facing the sector, especially around the sustainability challenges facing many credit unions. On the next slide, we look at the first of the impairment reviews, which is loan provisioning. The overarching guidance, which continues to inform the credit union's approach to assessing the level of required loan loss provisions on an ongoing basis, is the provisioning guidelines issued in April 2018. These guidelines are available on our website. Credit unions should consider how circumstances arising from the evolving economic situation may affect the likelihood of loss events occurring in their loan portfolios and apply provisions in a prudent manner. It is our expectation that boards will take a conservative approach to the measurement and recognition of loan provisions. Financial Reporting Standard 102 requires an incurred loss approach to calculation of bad debt provisions on loans and that all loans are reviewed for objective evidence of impairment. As detailed in my first slide, there are significant challenges to the global and domestic economy, heightened inflationary pressures and increased uncertainty in the medium term, all of which could impact on loan losses and provisioning requirements. 
credit unions should be mindful of this when assessing the adequacy of the loan provisions at year end. Moving on to impairment reviews on fixed assets, where credit unions are utilizing a value and use approach, i.e. where the market value of the fixed asset is lower than its carrying value, a review of the appropriateness of the underlying assumptions used in deriving the expected cash flows should be undertaken. The review should ensure that the assumptions are reasonable and supportable, particularly in the current economic environment, as I outlined in my first slide. The review of investments is another critical part of the year-end process. The accounting policy adopted by the Board of Directors of a credit union for the valuation of investments must comply with the relevant sections of the Credit Union Act 1997. We are expecting some credit unions to report investment losses this financial year. Section 110 of the 1997 Act requires that the amount of any item in the account should be determined on a prudent basis, and in particular that all liabilities and losses which have arisen or are likely to arise in the financial year to which the accounts relate or a previous financial year shall be taken into account. Full and detailed disclosure of the accounting policy adopted for the valuation of investments should be included in the annual accounts. Moving on to pensions. We have been highlighting pension costs and connected disclosure issues for some time now. While the scale of the deficit of the ILCU defined benefit pension scheme as advised by the League to its members during 2022 has not raised broader sector stability concerns, there will be financial impacts for all affected credit units. The importance and need for building and maintaining adequate levels of capital by credit unions to protect members against future unforeseen losses is clear with the need to cover pension deficits being a practical example of such a need. It is important that there is full clarity and transparency for members in the annual financial statements. Credit unions are therefore expected to take a prudent approach to the upfront recognition of associated financial impairments where they, where they have been advised of any pension, pension deficits arising. More broadly, credit union boards should be mindful of their obligations under section 108 of the, of the Act to ensure that the accounting records give a true and fair view of the state of affairs of the credit union and disclose the financial position of the credit union. They should also ensure compliance with the relevant accounting standards, including FRS 102 in respect of accounting for multi-employer defined pension benefits. Boards should also fully understand the implications of any new pension arrangements for their credit union including risk management considerations covering financial, operational, legal, and HR implications, and seek third-party advice as appropriate. Looking at uh, distributions and reserve management. As I detailed earlier, there continues to be elevated levels of risk and uncertainty regarding economic outlook with a challenging economic environment. The impacts of the pand pandemic have been acutely felt, felt by credit unions, with increases in the level of savings coupled with a significant decrease in loan demand, which resulted in continued decline in the reserve position of many credit unions. Maintaining and building adequate reserves, including adequate operational risk reserves, remains key to ensuring credit union financial stability and resilience. We expect all credit unions to continue to take a prudent approach to distributions in the context of reserve management. Any credit unions considering the potential for a proposed distribution are expected to contact their supervisor within RCU outlining the rationale for the proposed distribution, taking account of liquidity and operational resilience positions and the need to demonstrate prudent forward-looking capital reserve management in the current environment. We note that following the, notion, the motions approved at the 2020 ILCU AGM, there will be a refund from the Stabilisation Protection Scheme that will be reimbursed proportionately to affiliated credit unions. It is important for credit unions who are in receipt of such refund payments that they continue to exercise prudence in relation to their reserve management, especially in light of the global and domestic economic vulnerabilities referred to earlier. Moving on to systems and control and cybersecurity. In assessing the systems of control, the board and management should ensure comprehensive policies and procedures are in place, proper accounting records are maintained, and that effective segregation of duties and cash management processes are in place. The year-end process is an opportunity to review the internal controls environment and update as necessary. Given that there have been increased number of IT and cybersecurity incidents reported by organizations both domestically and internationally, credit unions need to be continuously vigilant regarding their IT system vulnerabilities, particularly from cyber risks, and ensure on an ongoing basis that they have strong systems of controls in place relating to their IT framework. Given the potential adverse financial, legal, customer, and reputational impacts arising, IT and cybersecurity risks remain a key focus for the, credit, or for the central bank and should be an ongoing priority for credit units. 
robust IT and cyber security controls must be in place for credit unions to be in compliance with sec section 76G 2A of the Act. And these should be integrated into the overall systems and control framework, including in relation to data security and business continuity arrangements. It is the responsibility of each credit union to understand the IT risks which they are exposed to and ensure that they are appropriately managed and mitigated. Moving on to accrued interest. In last year's year end letter, we set out our expectation that credit unions would take the necessary steps to take to address the accrued interest matter that gave rise to contingent liability noted in prior year ends financial statements. It is concerning that through our subsequent 2021 year end supervisory engagement, we identified instances where credit unions had not taken sufficiently evidence based decisions. This has led to further engagement with the registry with a cohort of relevant credit unions receiving correspondence on this matter last month. We again reiterate our expectation that all pertinent matters are considered in order for the 2022 financial statements to reflect an accurate and up to date position and an update on the position is provided to all members. Specifically, we expect that if a credit union has determined that any of its members has been affected, that those members have been advised of or are being advised of planned actions and reimbursements as appropriate. Moving on to the submission of the draft financial statements. The draft financial st statements return is to be submitted via the portal in advance of their finalization. Individual RCU supervisors may follow up directly with credit unions on, an, on any issues arising and or request a PDF version of the draft accounts. The investment portfolio return is due to be submitted next week on the 28th of October, and this is due also to be submitted through the CBI portal. Any questions or issues in relation to the submissions, please contact your supervisor within RCU. In conclusion, when preparing their 2022 year-end accounts, credit unions should take account of all matters set out in the 2022 financial year-end circular. The board of directors need to, be, to carefully consider the adequacy of loan provisions, other asset impairments, and prudent reserve management in 2022, given the current uncertain economic outlook and significant related challenges. Maintaining and building adequate levels of reserve including operational risk reserves, remains key to ensuring credit union financial stability and resilience. Credit unions should take a prudent, conservative approach to the 2022 year end in terms of distributions, reserves management, provisions, impairment reviews, liquidity, and overall resilience. And finally, where credit unions are considering distributions, they should contact a supervisor within RCU, setting out the rationale for the proposal and how the proposal demonstrates prudent, forward-looking capital reserve management in the current environment. Many credit unions have already reached out to their supervisors, outlining, outlining their year-end plans. And indeed, some, some of those discussions have ended and the credit unions are finalizing their year-end year accounts and setting dates for the AGMs. On the final set of slides, there's links to uh, central bank publications, which we have issued this year and may be of interest to credit unions. As Elaine has outlined, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentations. And for now, I hand you over to Mark Ward to discuss climate change. Thank you, Owen. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so as Owen has pointed out today, I'm just going to talk briefly about the central bank's supervisory response to climate change. So if we uh, move on to the next slide, you'll see the um, areas that I'm going to cover uh, today very briefly. And I suppose we're going to start with the the, the central bank strategy on, on climate change and the overall strategy from the central bank and um, the central bank's climate change unit. Um, I'm just going to, I suppose, recap a little bit on the supervisory expectations correspondence that was sent to uh, to, to all um, and then talk a little bit about uh, the credit union engagement that we are planning in quarter four of this year. So if we move on to the next slide, we just talk uh, and touch a little bit on the Central Bank of Ireland's strategy on climate. So as you can see, the four pillars of the strategy are transforming, open and engaged, safeguarding, and future focused. So while a focus on climate change is applicable to all four pillars, the future focus pillar is really aimed at the strengthening of the resilience of the financial system to climate related risks and its ability to support the transition um, to a low carbon economy. 
So the important elements I think to look at here really are um, both the physical and transition risks. And, and these are going to be two elements that in our engagement with the sector uh, later in the year, uh, credit unions are really going to have to focus on. So I suppose physical risks are, are really the effects of climate change causing extreme weather events and I suppose that the knock on effects that can have. And I think a, a recently good example of this is um, when the River Rhine in Germany um, uh, when there was extreme drought earlier in the year, causing significant disruption to supply chains and all the knock on effects that that uh, would have um, and uh, to the financial sector. And uh, when we talk about transition risk, I suppose we talk about business sectors moving to a more sustainable and lower carbon uh, approaches. Um, so I suppose a good re recent example of that um, would be the pressure um, that is being applied on the farming sector at the moment to reduce carbon footprint by uh, up to 25%. So what will be the effects for them in transitioning um, to meet those targets? So if we move to the next slide, <clears throat> Just to talk a bit about the, the, the climate change unit. So I suppose, uh, um, you know, considering, I suppose, the, the, the overall strategy of the bank uh, in 2021, the central bank uh, established a dedicated climate change unit within its eternal governance structure. Um, and this was really to help steer the agenda and bring additional focus uh, to our work in this area. So main objectives uh, uh, of this, Climate change unit was to embed over time climate risk and sustainable finance considerations into the day to day work of the central bank and to ensure cohesion and consistency in the overall approach. Um, the, uh, the climate change risk and sustainable forum um, uh, has been uh, uh, set up um, this year and will meet twice yearly. Um, and the Credit Union Managers Association uh, are the, uh, the, the, the sole kind of uh, representatives on that forum um, for the credit union sector. Um, the minutes of each meeting on that, uh, on that forum um, are posted on the central bank website. Um, and the for forum really brings together climate change experts, industry representative bodies, regulated firms, and central bank representatives. And it's chaired by uh, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Sharon Donnery. So that's really, as part of the climate change unit, that is, I suppose, the external stakeholder engagement that the climate change unit um, has brought to bear um, uh, and, and is using that for, for external engagement. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, we're just going to touch um, a little bit on, yeah, there we go. If we're just going to touch a little bit on um, the, the correspondence that was issued to all uh, regulated entities in on the 3rd of November 2021. Uh, this was a letter issued um, by the governor uh, to all uh, regulated financial service providers, and it was in relation to the central bank's supervisory expectations. Um, uh, on climate and other environmental, uh, social and governance issues. So in summary, and probably not to recap, everybody uh, is probably well aware and, uh, of this letter, but in summary, these uh, supervisory expectations that were set out in the letter uh, really focused on five key areas, um, governance, risk management framework, scenario analysis, strategy, uh, business model uh, risk and uh, uh, disclosures. And they were the five uh, main areas touched on there. So if we move to the next slide, I think really moving on from that um, correspondence that was sent, uh, I suppose we now, as, as the Registry of Credit Unions, really needed to think about our engagement with the sector. And I think um, our first focus is really to try and establish what the exposures to climate change um, and, and similar risk is uh, within the sector. So, um, the, the engagement that is planned is, it was originally planned for quarter three of this year, but I suppose we did take uh, a view of all of the different asks that have been made of the, of the credit union sector um, uh, in quarter three, and particularly, I suppose, year end uh, and the investment uh, return that is currently with credit unions. And I suppose taking that all of that into account, uh, we have decided that we would issue um, 
this engagement to the sector in December 2022. So what are we hoping to to do and achieve by this? Um, <clears throat> the purpose of, uh, of the engagement, and this is going to be in the form of a survey, is to capture information from credit unions regarding the exposure to and management of climate related and environmental risks. So we intend to gather data on the level of awareness and risks uh, amongst credit unions, the exposure of credit unions to those risks, uh, and the actions that are being taken by credit unions to manage those risks. So, um, the idea here really, again, as I said, is just to, to try and establish what those exposures are and really to try and see if credit unions are in uh, the position at this point in time to identify those exposures. Um, and then uh, lastly, really, what are credit unions doing to, uh, to tackle those, those potential risks? So, um, yeah, as I said, the information from this will be analysed and it will be used then to inform our future supervisory strategy and engagement with the sector uh, in this area. So if we um, move on to the next slide, really um, just to kind of summarise, I suppose, um, what we've gone through here, um, the registry's journey on the supervisory response to climate change followed, the, um, followed kind of from the development of the overall central bank strategy on climate uh, and the subsequent establishment of uh, the climate change unit for that internal and external um, uh, stakeholder correspondence on climate change. Um, the central bank then set out the supervisory expectations to all regulated firms regarding uh, climate risk, um, which covered uh, the five areas that we outlined earlier. Um, and then at a registry level, our initial step is that planned engagement in December uh, of this year with the credit union sector to establish what has been done to date by credit unions um, regarding the exposure to management of uh, and management of climate related and environmental risks. And uh, as I said, then, the steps to be taken after that uh, will really, I suppose, depend on um, the, the responses that we receive back from the survey. And I suppose we, we will analyze those and um, that will, I suppose, inform uh, the next steps um, uh, in this area um, into 2023. So that is uh, all from me today. Um, I'm now gonna hand you over to my colleague, uh, John Marr, uh, who's going to cover um, member personal current accounts and uh, as set out by the other um, uh, speakers, if you do have any questions on this uh, on this topic, uh, happy to take them at the end. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I hope um, everybody can hear me. Um, I know you let me know if you can't, so I will um, start um, in looking at, uh, I suppose, uh, today's seminar, we and we did this a lot last year on uh, lending and that we reckoned that maybe it was a uh, further visit to lending because it's always topical and also then a uh, member of personal current account uh, that we would take a few minutes maybe just to discuss uh, and maybe share some information with you on that. Um, so maybe we kick off with the next slide and maybe take a few minutes on the uh, member of personal current account um, uh, just to, re uh, re um, to recall that obviously this is an additional service uh, given the nature of it and I suppose the specialist nature of it and the technical uh, aspects of it. It was um, a particular framework for application and approval was put in place uh, back in uh, 2016 and uh, our first approvals uh, in this area were in 2017. So I suppose a snapshot of where we are at present um, at September, uh, 77 credit unions are approved, uh, over 70 are up and running um, uh, with a number obviously uh, more recently approved ones that have to go through testing and uh, attestation and that uh, have to uh, yet to commence actually offering the product um, and uh, obviously you can see from uh, from PAYAC and from CUSOP that with credit unions approved and the number of outlets, the number of them would be multi outlet credit unions. I think there's well over 150 outlets where MCAS is available around the country at this point in time. Um, it's obviously very topical uh, um, with the uh, imminent exit of uh, KBC and uh, Ulster, um, so I think it, it has a particular resonance at the moment. Um, I suppose in the last uh, year or so, um, we have um, received a number of applications from credit unions below the initial um, threshold or the initial guideline of uh, 75 million of total assets and membership of 15,000, which were put in place at the time to reflect um, 
I suppose the the our understanding or our belief that this was the sort of requisite size really to be able to apply sufficient resources and have the uh, financial uh, capacity to set out on this route and to make a success of it and given the pathway to actually uh, make this um, make the service uh, you know stand on its own two feet. Um, so. Uh, the criterions that have come in below that particular number, it's obviously a set number. So, you know, 15,000, 14,000, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a particularly, you know, it, it can't be that rigid. Um, so we have been approved a number of credit unions below that. Um, um, and no different than the larger credit unions, we have gone through a, a rigorous process with them. Um, and challenged where we felt it's appropriate, um, where we, either we believe maybe that the um, that the expectations in terms of a number of accounts um, might be unduly optimistic, or the pathway to break even or that might just uh, not, you know, might be overly optimistic. And I believe in the main that's been a very positive experience. Um, and we have a number of of, of um, current um, applications in the pipeline. There's no uh, undue delay on them. Um, but we will always reserve that right, um, and we believe it is a useful part of the process to uh, to uh, revert and engage on that. Um, the other matter, particularly, I think, um, for you know smaller credit unions that may be of a smaller asset size and of smaller membership numbers, is really to that there is a, a rigorous and uh, robust due diligence undertaken. You know, regarding the the nature of the service, the intention of the service. There's no point in going through the whole process and then not actually applying sufficient resource to it or knowing what you want to achieve from it, um, because otherwise it just becomes a financial drain. It also becomes a resource drain where there may be other issues within the credit union, and that would be a particular issue um, that, that we would revert on if there are, if there are other issues, that either from supervisory engagement that we feel uh, should actually be prioritised at this point in time, which may uh, lead to either uh, a recommendation that would be, it either be deferred or take some more time to consider the uh, the implications of it. Um, something like the KBC and Ulster Bank, it's obviously it's a, an opportunity in one respect, but current account opening will still be a, a and current account service will still be a significant um, service after the uh, the exit of those incumbents. So, um, you know, regardless of the size, as I said, we will we will we will uh, engage. We will challenge uh, in a constructive manner in relation to uh, to MCAS and uh, notwithstanding the uh, the service provided by Payac and Cusop, which is significant, we believe there is a significant uh, resource challenge for credit unions to do this successfully, um, given that there are reputational issues, reputational risks involved in it. Um, and uh, and we believe that's critical to uh, uh, you know, a new service for, for many credit unions. So, um, Really, very little more I can say about that at, at this point in time. There is more information available uh, on the site on applying, and I know the providers in in the form of uh, Payac and Cusop provide um, it provide significant support services for um, for prospective credit unions. Um, but um, I suppose the final point on that was we we just think it's very important that credit unions reflect on their own unique uh, um, conditions locally. And, uh, and 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 reflect on that in terms of either bringing forward an application. Um, at early engagement with with your supervisor and with RCU, we would recommend. So that's really all I have to say on MCAS. Happy to take any questions or on it later um, as far as part of it. So if we might just move on to the, the uh, landing slides if we can. Um, so the uh, the first uh, part of it, maybe in, in terms of lending last year, uh, when we did a, a bit on this session, we looked at really uh, how significant credit unions are as part of the consumer lending um, market in Ireland. I mean, we, 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 you know, we, we made an effort, a reasonable effort, we believe, given our access to the information on on the the level of of um, credit union share in aggregate of that market, which tends to be in the uh, sort of uh, thirty five to forty percent mark, and we would believe that that has not changed significantly. Um, so I suppose looking at the most recent performance, given that we've come out of a number of years of very significant disruption, um, the um, the, the performance in the year to June, and obviously as the figures that we're looking at most recently are the June PR figures, given that PR um, for September is not finalized. So looking at year to year, uh, year and year and growth in credit union lending in total, uh, seeing growth of 6.7%. That's that's the, the most significant growth uh, going back to um, pre-COVID times. So it's significant that in the last three years, uh, overall lending has gone from 5 billion to 5.5 billion. So the 10% increase over the three years has been heavily dominated by the most recent 12 months. So that's a significant bounce back. Um, I suppose there's significant variations across the sector. Um, if I was to 
and um, that, that the uh, looking at the actual numbers that there's about 50 credit unions would have experienced double digit growth year on year you know so that's a significant pull in terms of pulling that figure up and at the other end of the, of the spectrum that there would be approximately 30 credit unions that uh, would have either had a, a static uh, growth or negative um, experience in in the uh, in the 12 months so obviously your own position within that is something that you can will be able to reflect on um, obviously, as the year uh, as we go through year end, and as you get access to the financial conditions publication that uh, Elaine referred to, which I think is a very valuable, um, a very valuable publication in terms of looking at um, your peer group in terms of asset size, and also then you know it, 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 as a comparator of sorts. So a couple of trends that are significant trends that I suppose looking a year on from last year that continue to be significant. Um, first one is that. Um, Longer maturity loans, and in particular in the five to ten year category, are, have, have become quite a dominant category uh, within overall credit union to the extent that it's now the second biggest category of lending after three to five year. So it's overtaken one to three year over the space of the last two to three years uh, in terms of, of uh, I suppose, uh, prominence within credit union lending. Um, it was a particular part of the change in regulations dating from uh, the start of 2020. Uh, but I suppose the trend had had started, but it has been accelerated by the lifting of the restriction on the five to ten unsecured lending category. Um, and it, it, it dwarfs, as I said, a number of the other categories at this stage, and it dwarfs even business lending and um, uh, and house lending. So it's a very significant part of the business, and it looks like. High number of credit unions have uh, have made uh, you know the the conscious decision to actually um, to focus on that area. Um, so uh, the second aspect is larger value loans. Obviously, um, okay, but this year I suppose was the first year in terms of seeing significant inflation, but there would there would be a, a marked increase in the larger value loans, and that would be related to the longer maturity uh, loans, and uh, and it, you know, and that would be even excluding the impact of house loans, which is relatively minor in the overall scale of things. Um, and then I suppose the third aspect that's worth reflecting on is that we're seeing a fewer number of loans overall, um, and that is probably reflective of the, 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 the smaller numbers of loans in the zero to one and one to three year category, um, which uh, would have been, as most credit unions would know, is a very high um, use of resource in terms of the numbers of loans and numbers of small value loans, and we're aware of the number of initiatives in, in that space by credit unions. Um, and, and I suppose the fewer number of loans uh, alongside that, in parallel with what has been uh, about a 10% increase in membership overall in the last uh, three years, I think membership of the total credit unions is 3.5 million at the at most recent measure versus 3.2 million uh, three years ago. So there's a sort of an increasing overall uh, level of uh, membership, which would, would suggest that there's a, a widening in terms of the the number of savers to borrowers, uh, and obviously the number of borrowers to savers um, is something I think worth tracking over time. Um, thankfully, I think uh, there has been a decline in arrears uh, in over over um, uh, in uh, greater than nine years bucket. So I think that's that's reassuring from the point of view that credit unions are moving into these newer category and either higher value loan area. And it's at this point, it's not showing any particular impact or any adverse impact. Obviously, it's quite early in the cycle when you're looking at five to ten or even longer than ten year lending. Um, but that, that's, uh, I think, is a point worth making. Um, the point has been well made already by uh, by uh, Owen and uh, Elaine previously. The uncertain conditions looking forward, you know, is something I think were important to flag. So I think moving on to the next slide, we might just take a quick look at, um, I think, first of all, business lending. I think, yeah, business lending still remains a very small proportion of credit union lending. It's about 2.5%. As at as at at June, um, and in number in numbers of loans, uh, for example, that that is only about seven and a half thousand loans in total. The number of loans that have been advanced, if you look back over a number of years, um, in the last um, number of years, has you know fourteen thousand loans advanced. Which obviously, looking at that, there's a relatively short maturity on business loans. So there's quite a bit of activity, but not a significant number of loans in, uh, involved in terms of gross loans outstanding, which would be suggestive of shorter. Um, you know, working capital, stocking type facilities being being quite a dominant or predominant uh, um, uh, purpose of of loan. So the value of of loans has uh, has uh, gone from seventy million to one hundred and forty million in the five years, uh, the most recent five years. Still, as I said, a relatively small part of 
overall lending. Um, so the but a, a, a notable um, change in the most recent 12 months is the average business loan. It has increased significantly. It was 13K in 2017, 25K in uh, 2022. Um, and I suppose that the biggest single jump in that has been in the last 12 months. So I think that's something worth reflecting on. It's something that we can obviously look at further when we see the September figures and, and, and look to uh, comment on it in the uh, financial conditions paper. Um, so uh, the number of uh, credit unions that are actively involved in business lending is relatively, relatively low um, in terms of that. It's predominantly community credit unions, predominantly non-Dublin. Um, and 40 credit unions account for almost, oh, well, I think it's over three quarters, or in or around three quarters of all business lending. So looking at that and looking at some of the collaborated um, and the um, efforts out there in relation to particular categories of lending, it would appear that agriculture is, is a particularly dominant um, uh, purpose of business lending. So um, that, that's really all I have to say of business lending, but uh, maybe moving on to house lending. Um, so. Again, house lending gets a lot of, uh, I think it gets a lot of uh, uh, coverage, obviously, with the mortgage market and again with two significant mortgage players uh, leaving the market. So it is worth reflecting on on, on that, that as of June, there's 300 million in house loans. So 6% uh, of, of credit union lending um, and that's up from 4%. So it has been an increase, but it's still not, it's still not represent a material amount of, of credit union lending. The average new house loan has increased, um, I suppose, to what would be expected to be maybe more normal um, sort of typical house loan, um, I suppose, loan, loans to value, you know, particularly at a national level in that it's gone now over the 100K mark was in the most recent uh, in the most recent year. Again, not unlike uh, business lending, um, the, uh, house lending is is dominated by 30 credit unions. In this case, um, uh, over 80 percent is accounted for by uh, 30 credit unions and with over 100 credit unions have have no um uh, no exposure to to credit to house loans from i suppose looking at it from a, a, a registry perspective um we would make the point and we have made the point continually that it is a specialist type of lending that getting into it for either you know um or, or you know dipping the toe in the water or just getting two or three house loans and all that would not be deemed to be really being active in the house lending. It's an it's a, an important category of lending. It has a very uh, specialist nature to it, uh, and it does require special skills and a particular framework. Um, and as always, we you know we we don't have a, a lot of instances of that. You know, other than the established credit unions. When I mentioned about the thirty credit unions, the other relevant point around that is that very few have actually entered it from, I suppose, a, a, a zero position in recent years, that 30 has been, have been there, there or, and have been, if anything, become more active as there's been greater enablement um, from uh, the change in regulations. So um, to, I, I suppose my final slide is to really look, look at the, uh, the concentration limits, because I know it's, it's, again, it's a very topical matter. Um, just to, to summarise that these were changed for in 2019, effective from uh, 2020 with the base limit. I won't go into that, but this, for those that are active in this area, they'd be aware of the base limit of 7.5% with the ability to uh, to go to 10% on notification or 15% by application. So, um, the capacity at this stage, and we've, we, we have made this point, um, the lending capacity uh, in the in the business area is probably the, the least utilized, and um, it's at zero point seven percent of total assets, where five percent is the actual um, is 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 the minimum or, or is the first, I suppose, a uh, floor in relation or, or ceiling in relation to uh, business lending, and with house lending, which given that it's about twice the level of uh, business lending overall, you can see then that that's about one and a half percent. So in total. It, there's really 2.2 percent. It would be the obviously the aggregated figure of a seven and a half percent, you know, lower limit. And then obviously with the entitlement of for larger credit unions to either uh, go further up the scale in terms of 10 percent or 15 percent, we are aware that well over 90 percent have significant headroom before coming close to the base limit. Um, and of that remaining 10 percent. Um, a number, as a point out there, have already applied for and been approved uh, for the increased limit, and that obviously affords them the ability to um, to go in a considered manner to the next level. And part of that approval process has been for them to demonstrate and to illustrate how they intend to do that. And I think it's been a very, again, 
has been a very uh, worthwhile part of the exercise for us to be able to engage with the credit unions and to be reassured in relation to the uh, the manner in which uh, the the intentions uh, of the credit unions are reflected and 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 I think that's been encouraging from our from our perspective um so um there, there are a number of other uh, active notifications of the 10 percent um combined limit and uh, I think that's uh, they're they're in train at the moment so there is no backlog on those um and you know again early engagement with the supervisor with supervisors on it I think is a worthwhile part of the uh, engagement in relation to the application process and the final point and it is it is I think it's, it's particularly relevant in this area as part of CP 125 which you know predates the change in regulations we did commit to carrying out a review of the uh, lending three years post commencement and we've now uh, we're coming towards the end of that third year albeit a very uh, unusual three years in every respect um, uh, so the amendment to the lending framework so what we would intend to do is to assess and analyze the impact of these changes on lending in the sector so I think that's an important part of our uh, of our of our work uh, of our work plan for the coming year um, and I think that that's important so I think um, the concentration limits. I know it's 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 a very topical point with particularly credit unions, uh, and that one, and we are engaging on it quite actively at present. So um, I that's really where it's at. I'm very happy to um, respond to any comments or, or questions. Uh, um, you know, um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, James McCauley at this stage. So James, uh, if you're online. Thanks, John. I am indeed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to assume you can all hear me, but if you can't, you can let me know in the chat box. So this evening, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of credit union restructuring that has taken place during 2022, and looking back at the profile of restructuring over a five-year period. I'm also going to be providing some insights into the current restructuring trends that we within the registry are experiencing through the COE process, uh, both in transfer or and transferee credit unions. And finally, I'm going to take a look at some of the solutions that have been provided by restructuring to date. So if I can just jump onto my first slide. Um, and to start with, I want to provide a brief overview of the sector profile as of where we are now in 2022. It's fair to say that 2022 has been another active year for TOE activity in the sector, and restructuring continues to contribute to the transformation of the sector. So Firstly, just to look at the profile of restructuring to date in the year to date, RCU have successfully completed eight transfer engagements, and these TOEs or transfers have involved transferees with asset sizes ranging from just under 40 million to over 400 million, and transfer or credit unions with total asset sizes ranging from just under 5 million to more than 40 million. So I suppose what you can see from that is the variance in asset sizes here for us demonstrates the broad range of both scale and complexity that we continue to experience when we engage with both transferee and transfer or credit unions. So turning my attention now to the, the five-year profile armor structuring in the graphic at the bottom of the slide, uh, you'll see that that profile there starting back in 2018 and up to the year to date in 2022. So you'll see CUE projects have been quite stable overall with around 16 completing in the in 20, back in 2018 and moving steadily across the table to 14 completing in 2021, as I mentioned already, eight in the year to date in 2022. Uh, also worth noting that we have a number of additional projects as of now in our active pipeline that are due for completion in the, in the next few months. You'll also note the liquidation of one credit union completed in 2020 and a more recent voluntary dissolution completed in 2021 of another credit union. So. Whilst the number of these TOE projects completed in these years has remained stable, we've seen quite a variance, as I say, in relation to the reasons and the motivating factors for these TOEs with governance issues, financial performance, strategic direction, and in some cases, operational or staffing issues giving rise to credit union's decision to enter into a TOE process. I'll explore some of these factors more when I come to discuss the trends that we've been seeing in restructuring shortly. For now, of the TOEs completed during these past five years, we noted that 14% of those have received private sector funding to support that completion of a transfer. And so for ourselves, what does that indicate? For those credit unions, this funding has provided a better solution in those cases, which may have potentially resulted in a different outcome in the absence of that funding. 
Moving to the, the infographic, the map infographic on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see an updated overview of the counties that have undergone uh, restructuring activity. I should say here at the outset, just for reference, whilst I've looked already at a five year profile in this slide, the map on the right hand side compares the position back from 2008 up until the present day. So back in 2008, the number of credit unions within the sector was 419 has reduced now, as you can see there, 204 as of today's date, representing a reduction of about 51%. So as you can see in the same map, this stage, and I hope you can make it out, apologies, I appreciate some of the numbers are quite small, but we'll have this available afterwards. As I say, every county has undergone restructuring activity, either in the capacity of a transfer or credit union, or as a transferee credit union in TOE process. In some counties, restructuring has exceeded 70% versus the position as the credit unions were back in 2008. And overall, we have 13 of the 26 counties reported on the infographic have experienced restructuring of 50% or greater. So I'm going to move on to my next slide now and just look quickly at some of the restructuring trends. So in considering some of the trends we've seen as part of TOE projects in this past 12 to 18 months, I plan to look at these trends under three separate headings. So firstly, some of the motivation we've seen that has brought both transferee and transferor credit unions into TOE projects. Secondly, looking at some of the solutions that restructuring has provided to those credit unions who have entered into and successfully completed TOE projects. And lastly, emphasizing some of the supports that are available and offered to credit unions by ourselves and the Registry of Credit Unions in relation to restructuring proposals. So, turning to motivation first, this obviously differs from credit union to credit union. But one of the trends we've experienced in recent TOE proposals is a more strategic emphasis to proposals from credit unions. So what do I mean by that? We see examples of strong, well-positioned credit unions approaching us here in the registry and looking to use restructuring as a strategic enabler for members of both credit unions involved in the process. So this has included plans to restructure in order to better position a credit union to apply for and offer MPCAS services at an increased scale to members in the future, as well as some examples of credit unions looking for an improved online and digital service offering to its members as a motivating factor in entering into a TOE process with another credit union. So these examples have members' interests at the core of their proposals, and they're some of the more positive examples that we see. We've also seen the potential of a strengthened or improved governance framework within transferee credit unions acting as a motivating factor for certain transfer proposals. And one example we experienced recently had, challenge, had challenges in a transfer or credit union in respect of some of the key board and management positions perhaps approaching, approaching retirement. And in the absence of a suitable succession plan or availability of individuals to fill these roles, the credit union chose themselves to bring forward a proposal to engage in a transfer of engagements with a neighboring more established credit union that had a well-resourced management team that had the capacity to take on the project. So when we look back and review these TOE projects, such as those I've mentioned, we've seen examples of the successful overlay of management and board structures in a combined entity, as well as the ability for both credit unions to benefit from a strengthened governance and management capacity in the overall combined entity. So keeping with motivation just for a moment, uh, another factor we've experienced this year is the desire, and I know has alluded to some of this already as I say, is the desire to offset one-off or exceptional items in the balance sheet, whereby they may have had an adverse impact on the financial of the credit union. So as I say, Owen has discussed some of these during his presentation as part of the financial year end, but the impact of these issues obviously differs at a sector level versus an individual credit union level, some credit unions. But in limited cases, these issues have been what we might consider a push factor for restructuring activity, which has encouraged the credit unions in these cases to expedite the conversation in relation to restructuring and their overall strategic direction. Another motivating trend that we've experienced this year is the potential to perhaps improve operational resilience be that through greater availability of resources at an operational level or through an enhanced operational control framework in a larger, more established credit union acting as a transferee. So one example we can share we've experienced in a recent case was a TOE whereby a credit union was aware of a series of deficiencies and weaknesses in its own systems and controls in relation to its operations. 
these issues had been identified by its own assurance functions, including both the internal and external auditor. The credit union in this case assessed its own ability to remedy these issues on a standalone basis and following consideration of the issues at board level, made a decision themselves to enter into a TOE process in order to more efficiently remediate those risks that they identified in the overall operation of the troll framework. Those are just some of the factors we've seen in terms of current trends. I'm going to move on to solutions now and look at what we've experienced there, the mayor this year, excuse me. So firstly, looking at the ability to tailor each individual transfer solution to suit the needs of both the transferor and the transferee, the tailoring of the process enables a more suitable and appropriate solution to some credit unions, depending on their own timelines and capacity to complete the, uh, the, the stage, each stage of the process. This is something that we within the registry assess on a case by case basis, ensuring that a risk focused approach is at the center of each stage of the process. I suppose keeping with the, the subject of the stages within the TOE process, the phased approach that we take to transfers still offers the most comprehensive solution in terms of both identification and remediation of risk in the early stages of each TOE process. This approach ultimately means that as credit unions move through the process, they should have remediated the more material issues early on and a better position themselves to present these TOE proposals to their membership at the, at the latter stages. The other solution that TOEs have provided has been to aid and resolve where credit unions have identified weaknesses in their own governance frameworks that they've been unable to resolve themselves. So leveraging a more established and mature governance framework in another credit union has proven to be a very effective method of remediating risks identified in those particular cases. So lastly, just turning my attention to some of the supports that are available in conclusion. Um, some of the supports we've made available to credit unions as part of TOE processes and proposals. Obviously, it needs to be noted that the TOE process is a voluntary process. It remains open to any credit union. Our team on the intervention and restructuring team within the registry has resources available to offer support and answer any questions that boards or managers may have in relation to the process, in relation to the workload, or in relation to timelines involved. We're happy to meet with credit unions and discuss general questions and proposals they may have. But given the time of year, and Owen has alluded to this part of his presentation, as credit unions are in the midst of their own year-end processes and looking at the financial performance and future direction of each of their own credit unions, we would ask that any credit union considering potential transfer or restructuring activity may contact with ourselves within the registry. Uh, my own contact details are available there on screen for anybody that wants them. Or they can they can email the, the general or your inbox and the message will reach us. But the, the direct dial is there on screen if anybody wants to ask me any questions in relation to the transfer engagement activity. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Nula Lawless, who's going to finish up my talk on some of the support conditions. Just bear with me one moment. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, James. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the Central Bank of Ireland portal. Uh, so the portal aims to simplify how we engage with institutions, how institutions engage with the central bank uh, on a range of services and in a more secure fashion. The portal was launched um, in April 2021 to credit unions. The services uh, you see in front of you are the services currently available to credit unions uh, on the portal. Uh, I'm going to uh, run through um, these services over the next few minutes. And um, I, a lot of you will probably be familiar with the portal and familiar with the login screen to the right as you're already using it. And at the end of the presentation, I'm just going to touch on what is planned for 2023 uh, with the portal. So on the next slide, you will see on the left hand side is the navigation pane, um, which is available to portal users when they log in and shows all the various uh, services available uh, to the portal administrator or user, whoever logs in. So I'm just gonna look at a few of these areas. So under the institution details, which is highlighted there with the red arrow, the credit union can see general information about uh, the credit union itself. 
This includes institution details, such as the registered name or the re uh, regulatory status, contact information, so the name, email, address, and telephone number, and contact reason, where the contact reason is uh, the primary contact, the secondary contact, the chair, or the manager. Uh, their addresses are also stored there, so the address type, such as the registered address or billing address, so that will contain the address type and the details and services is under activities and this uh, um, shows what business services um, are approved uh, for a particular credit union. I'd just like to kind of bring to your attention here, especially uh, with contact information, that credit unions are responsible for maintaining their credit union contact information on the portal. RCU use this contact information when communicating with credit unions. So, for example, when we're issuing circulars, we um, pull out the email address of the primary and secondary contact from this contact information. Or if we're making contact with a manager or chair, we will go to this contact information to get the telephone number or the email. So it is important that credit unions maintain this information and um, keep it up to date. So moving on to the next slide. These are the request changes. Oh, sorry. These are the request changes um, that are available uh, to credit unions. It's not a full uh, suite of all request changes, um, but it is uh, some of the more common, I suppose, request changes that are used. These request changes are for applications for approvals, for notifications, for rule amendment, uh, registration requests, and also uh, to change the contact. Um, I'll just highlight here that the change of contact, uh, when that is submitted, that is automatically updated. But for the other request changes, um, they go through a process. Um, and if you see on the left where the request changes and click on that, you will see uh, all the request change history and um, ones that are completed, uh, that are in progress, and also when uh, where the new request change can be submitted by a credit union. Um, so uh, in terms of this uh, request change, when a request change is approved, um, then I mentioned about the services provided er earlier. So if, for example, you had a 15% concentration limit for house and business loans approved, when that is approved, the services section under the activity in the institution details is also updated. So we'll move on to the next slide. Messages and actions. So portal related communications are issued to portal administrators and portal users uh, through portal messages. We issue portal messages uh, to portal administrators around specific uh, portal information such as if new services are going to be um, added uh, to the portal. Or we issue messages uh, directly to portal users if it's in relation to a specific request change query. And so when we um, send, when RCU sends a portal message um, to a portal user or portal administrator, an email message notification is sent uh, to the portal account email. So that will appear in the portal user's email account from the portal communications at centralbank.ie and it will say a communication has been sent to you by the central bank and it will instruct that person to log into the central bank to view the messages. So that person should log in to the central bank and then click on the message you see there on the left hand side. Actions. So when we have request change follow up actions um, or see you issue a message, a portal action um, to the credit union in relation to that specific action. And um, this enables a credit union to update the information associated with an in progress request change uh, while that action is open. These actions can be seen under pending actions there on the left hand side highlighted with the uh, red arrow. OK, I'll move on to the next slide. Returns. So in June this year, uh, we introduced a single sign on, and this enables portal administrators and portal users to access returns through the portal without separately logging on to the INR. Return access security is enhanced by utilizing the portal multi factor uh, authentication. We advise all credit unions who are accessing or submitting returns to access the returns through the portal and not through the ONR login directly. Some people will be able to continue to use the ONR um, to submit returns if, it, if they had that access uh, in the past prior to the June release. But we would ask that um, credit unions uh, access these returns through the portal going forward. 
I did look at um, some of the uh, information in advance of this in terms of um, how many uh, credit unions were accessing returns directly on the portal or on the O&R. And I'm glad to say that um, in terms of the uh, usage, uh, it is positive. So of the 96 credit unions who had accessed returns, whether it was the September uh, 2022 return or the draft financial statements um, or the investment recent investment return, 56 or 58 percent of those credit unions had either viewed or signed off those credit, those returns through the portal, and 42 percent had done it directly and um, through O&R. So that's a real um, positive um, uh, transition that uh, credit unions are doing to transition to the portal and access um, returns. We are aware of access and submission challenges and issues that credit unions have reported in relation to the investment return. And this also includes um, the attachment to the broad to the message, uh, which had the guide um, uh, explaining how to um, provide access to this return. Uh, this issue is now resolved, and portal administrators can now access this attachment um, to the message. Where technical issues um, are experienced, we will be flexible on the June on the October 28 deadline for the investment returns. And where credit unions are awaiting portal support response in, in relation to access or um, submission queries, and they believe the October 28 deadline is potentially at risk, please inform RCU at centralbank.ie. We will issue an email on the investment return in the coming days based on the feedback we have received, and we will highlight that uh, action in terms of contacting RCU uh, if there is technical issues and what to do. And uh, just to note um, that auditors will not be enabled on the portal until late, later in 2023. So it's only credit unions that are accessing returns um, through the portal for the moment. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, so the uh, portal administrator uh, is responsible for your credit union's use of the portal, including the management of portal users' access and permissions. And they must ensure that permissions are appropriate for the portal user role. Um, typically, it's a credit union manager who is the portal administrator. All credit unions must have a portal administrator in place at all times, because as you can see, they'll be providing access, they'll be managing the access, and portal related communications are issued to portal administrators. Uh, the positive take up um, of the credit unions um, has been um, observed. Uh, and Portal administrators have been given access to the various services I've already mentioned, including request changes, messages, etc. Uh, for example, request changes submitted, I think 91% of credit unions have submitted one or more request changes. And as I also mentioned earlier, access to returns um, has been 58% uh, at a point in time last week. So again, that's very positive. So I move on to the next slide. Uh, so I'm briefly going to touch on the portal changes in 2023. So we will be turning off the O&R logins at some point in 2023. And access to all O&R services will only be permitted um, through the portal. Therefore, we would strongly urge you to um, access returns uh, through the portal as we've been communicating uh, in our recent communications. Fitness and property individual questionnaire um, services will also be moved from the ONR to the portal in target H1 next year. And you will see an increased usage of portal messages and actions in 2023. So if we move on to the next page. So finally, uh, in a quick summary is uh, if you, we would ask the credit unions to access the ONR returns and through the portal. Uh, credit union portal administrators are responsible for managing portal users' access and permissions, and this includes access to returns through the portal. And we would ask that you provide the relevant access in a timely manner. Keep your contacts up to date on the portal um, to ensure that you do receive central bank communications. And portal related communications uh, will are issued to portal administrator and portal users, and they will increase uh, next year. And finally, portal support. There is a portal help section on the Central Bank of Ireland portal webpage, and I've um, included a little picture there to the right. It has a lot of useful information um, in it to help um, navigate um, through the portal. So have a look at that or um, contact portal support if you have any queries.